Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. I'm Jen Judson, coming to you today from our studio in Washington, D.C. Joining me today is Bradley Bowman, Senior Director of Foundation for Defense of Democracy's Center on Military and Political Power. And joining us virtually from Honolulu, we have Mark Montgomery, Senior Director of the Center on Cyber and Technology Innovation at FDD. President Trump issued an executive order to establish an Iron Dome or a shield for missile defense of the homeland in his first week in a second term as president. We're here to talk about what this might look like and what it means for the future of missile defense of the homeland and beyond. Brad and Mark, thank you for joining me again. Can you provide some broad brushstrokes on what Trump is calling for in his executive order here? You know, how does this pivot from previous approaches to missile defense of the homeland and what we have now? There's a lot of nuance here, and I think some of the nuance is being missed in some of the uh, popular reporting, and I really appreciate how you dig into the details. Um, I'll start with, with the name. You know, the Iron Dome name, I think, is a little unfortunate because it creates some confusion and easy opportunities for critics. Um, but I think a lot of people are um, kind of missing that there is actually something of value going on here. And when I say that, what I mean is that um, our homeland, which is, you know, as uh, President Trump said in his first national security strategy in his first term, is, you know, it, th there's a responsibility to protect the American people and protect our, our country. I mean, I, I, at the most basic level, isn't that the most important job of the Department of Defense? And so um, I, I, I agree with that. And this is, to some degree, an effort to kind of act on that impulse uh, that was codified in their first national security strategy. Um, and so I think that's good in terms of interest. And then from interest, you, we know in strategy, you go to threats. And, mm. and the reality is that our adversaries, uh, what we're calling at FDD, our axis of aggressors, adversaries, China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea, each of them in their own ways to different degrees are, mm -hmm. um, have been um, undertaking serious, comprehensive efforts, at sometimes sprinting to field more capabilities to hit us here at home both in terms of what the older folks will remember as kind of nuclear ICBM level, great power stuff, but also conventional strikes, which might be a new concept for many Americans, um, and not just ballistic missiles, but also hypersonic and cruise missiles. Mm -hmm. And um, the reality is, is that um, if our adversaries think that they can hit us here at home, they may believe that we're deterred in terms of defending our interests abroad. And so a lot of, I think, uh, people kind of just thinking of this at a superficial level, they might think of aggression in the Taiwan Strait or in Europe and the Middle East as disconnected. I don't see them as disconnected at all, because mm -hmm. if you think about our essential strategy during the Cold War, uh, mutual assured destruction, mm -hmm. that's essentially a strategy of deterrence by punishment. Uh, in other words, we never thought we would be able to shoot down all of, of the Soviet Union's ICBMs. Reagan famously proposed the Strategic Deterrence Initiative or Star Wars, and mm -hmm. you know, that was widely mocked, but uh, an important conversation. And, and my point now is be, the threat has evolved s to such a significant degree and is so much more serious, and our adversaries are becoming so much more capable to hit us here at home in a variety of ways. I think we can no longer... Uh, over rely solely on deterrence by punishment. We have to increase our deterrence by denial. And we know that when you combine those two sub elements of deterrence, then you have more. And so we want to avoid a scenario where uh, Xi Jinping, the People's Republic of China says, okay, it's 2027, 2028, it's time to roll the dice in the Taiwan Strait and go for it. And if you think about what some of the war plans might be, there might be a need to hit China in their mainland. Well, if we hit them in their mainland, they might hit us in our mainland. Um, and if we have no means to do anything about that, that might affect their decision to undertake aggression. So protect the American people at home and also understand how what we do here is going to affect decisions related to aggression right. abroad. Mark, I'm going to let you take it away, too. Thanks. You know, um, I agree with, 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 with what Brad said. And, and I'd go a little further and say this is a, a recognition that, you know, um, the adversaries can bring and I throw <coughs> cyber in here, too, that we're no longer our homelands, not just susceptible to a terrorist threat. We're now susceptible to peer adversaries using cyber tools and missile tools to impact our ability to generate forces to fight. In other words, uh, hit our, our mobility systems, our transportation systems, hit our airfields in the United States. This has happened because China and Russia have invested aggressively in hypersonic maneuvering missiles. These aren't the hypersonic missiles you hear about in the Russia-Ukraine fight. These are hypersonic missiles that are going you know, faster than Mach 5 and also maneuvering. And they defeat the ability of our uh, Aegis, FAD, Patriot systems to intercept them. So they've made significant advancements in that. And then the Chinese are developing systems, ships, submarines, aircraft that 
and go farther and farther from the coast, much like the Russians do already, to launch cruise missiles at us. So we now have a cruise missile threat, a hypersonic threat, and we have no defense against hypersonics. And our only defense against cruise missiles is in the area you two are sitting right now, in the national capital region. We have a very limited cruise missile defense capability. So what the president's executive order recognizes is that we actually have to design and architect a defense of the critical assets of the United States. That's not all of the United States. It's the critical assets of the United States against this emerging Chinese and Russian threats, and we need to do it pretty fast. Now, you know, one of the things I thought was striking about the executive order um, and uh, something I've thought about a lot in the past is why is our homeland defense focused on rogue nations like Iran and North Korea and not on Russia and China? Those seem to be you know, our focused adversaries right now, um, near peer adversaries. Uh, so it was refreshing to see that the focus is now much broader. It's, it's you know, we've got to keep our eye out on our capabilities versus Russia's and, and China's capabilities. Um, and in addition, like you said, more of a focus on cruise missile threat or, or unmanned aircraft systems that could uh, pose a threat to the homeland as well. So it, it went a lot broader, mm -hmm. which, was, which was good to see. Um, one of the things, though, um, I thought was interesting about the executive order is it requires an architecture kind of be put in place, proposed within 60 days. Is that time frame doable, given, I guess, some of the groundwork that's been done on some of these things in the past? Um, talk a little bit about meeting this particular deadline for for uh, establishing something quite complex here. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in and eager to hear from Mark as well, who I know <laughs> will have a, lots of great thoughts on this. Uh, you know, those who read the executive order carefully saw the 60-day element that you just referred to, and they also saw that, uh, uh, and they may have also observed that uh, a request uh, for information from industry went out with a due date of February 28th, which is uh, two weeks from today. <laughs> so talk That's, about a quick yeah, turnaround. Yeah. and. Uh, those of us who are used to the timelines and defense acquisition and, and this sort of thing realize that that's like light speed. And so, yeah. um, uh, you know, I'm confident that uh, the various elements of the Department of Defense are, are, are jumping on this because when it, they have clear direction from the commander in chief, um, uh, you know, but haste can make waste. And so I, I suspect they're going to want to meet these deadlines, but uh, there's going to be a lot of action following these deadlines to kind of clean up initial messes and refine and that sort of thing. But I actually kind of, you know, we can debate whether 60 days should have been, you know, 120 or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But I, I kind of like it uh, at the broadest level because one of my um, biggest uh, concerns really across the board, whether I look at, uh, you know, our arsenal of democracy, our, our defense industrial base, acquisition policy, security cooperation, is just um, a lot of patriotic, hardworking people, but a, a lack of urgency, just a, a significant lack of urgency. I'm not saying anyone's deliberately trying to slow things down. But um, uh, w when I scan the geostrategic environment and I look at what the, na the bipartisan congressionally mandated National Defense Strategy Commission said about, you know, the, the geostrategic situation being more daunting right now than anything we've seen since 1945 and looking at some of the timelines for, for potential additional aggression, I, I think the one thing we don't have is time. And I'm reminded of George Marshall's famous quote that is overused when he was Army Chief of Staff. When I had the time, I, I, I didn't have the money. And when I had the money, I didn't have the time. And so um, I, I, I think uh, a, a, a clear signal from the Oval Office saying this is a priority, this is an unaddressed threat, and we better hurry up and I expect you to deliver quickly, I think is positive. 